Well, good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. You know, for the past six months, due to all that's been involved with the coronavirus, while we've not been able to have regular in-person, indoor services here in the sanctuary, we are now at a place where, with the appropriate precautions, physical distancing, wearing a mask, we are able to have outdoor in-person services. We experienced just a taste of this a couple of weeks ago at August at Cala Mesa when we gathered for camp meeting on Friday evenings here at the church. And today we are beginning at Mesa Grande Academy at 11 o'clock for the next six weeks to take advantage of the good weather and have some in-person outdoor services. Figured we might as well do that while we can, while the weather's good and then we'll see where we are at the end of those six weeks. There are also some junior high and youth and family Sabbath schools that are taking advantage of that same thing and having some of their Sabbath schools outside. Although the adult Sabbath schools, the sanctuary Sabbath school class and uh, contemporary issues are still meeting online through Zoom. However, having said that, there are also a number of people who for a variety of reasons The 11 o'clock outdoor in-person service does not work quite as well. And so for the benefit of those, we're going to continue to offer an 8.30 a.m. online option, which we're calling Cala Mesa Classics. It will include up-to-date but pre-recorded announcements and prayer, and some music and a message that has been previously shared here at the church by one of the members of the pastoral staff. And so we'll be providing that as an 8.30 worship service. So for our first service folk who like to enjoy worship at 8.30, perhaps followed by Sabbath school and then having the rest of your day free, or for those individuals who are in higher risk categories, but who are not ready yet for the outdoor in-person venue, we will still have the 8.30 online service. And of course, for those of you who don't wanna miss anything at all, you can come to the 8.30 service and you can still go to Sabbath school online or outside if that's your particular group and still either go to the 11 o'clock service outside or watch it online because we'll be live streaming that service as well. And so for those of you who don't want to miss out on anything, we have that option. So whatever your situation may be this morning, we want to be sure that we have a worship option that works well for you. So that as things continue to change and as we continue to adapt, we don't leave anyone behind. And so once again, I'd like to say welcome. We are glad you're worshiping with us this morning. Good morning, Cala Mesa Church family. This morning, it's that time for us to participate in the worship service in our weekly giving. And you know, despite the fact that we are continuing to be in this coronavirus situation in which we're unable to be together and uh, be in our wonderful church facility. Uh, The work of the church still continues. And I don't mean the global church, although that is continuing, but I mean the work of the Cala Mesa church is continuing every day. And so it's our privilege to be able to partner with the church in giving of our tithes and offerings and this week our offering is for the local church budget and you know the many programs and the maintenance and the continual expenses that occur within our church uh, every week every day, every month, even when we're not there. But more than that, we want to demonstrate our trust, our faith 
in a God who supplies all our needs, and whether that's individually or as a family or as the church. Uh, and I know that for some, this time has been especially difficult because of work layoffs or reduction in time working. But I challenge you to be faithful, to just trust that the Lord has your back, that the Lord knows what you need and the Lord will provide. And so for those who can give, uh, may you do so liberally, generously, and in faith. And for those who cannot at this point in time, uh, give of the offering of your prayer, of your worship, and cling to the promises that he has made for you, for you. Let's pray as we ask God to bless our tithes and offerings at this time. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for the privilege of extending our hand to yours. Your hand is always extended to us. But at this very time, as we return our tithes and offerings in whatever way that may be, online, or may we drop off a check at the church, however we return our tithes and offerings, may we do so confident in your grace, confident in your love for us, and confident that you know our needs. You know every one of our needs whatever they may be. And in returning our tithes and offerings, we say to you, Lord, we trust you. We trust you with our lives. We trust you with all that we are and all that we have and put them in your hands. And so bless these tithes, bless these offerings as they are given from grateful and thankful hearts today. For we lift up our praise to you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your Sabbath day, family.
Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. my rescue where else can I go there's no other name by which I am saved capture me with grace I will follow you this world has nothing for me I will this world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing for me. Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. I am saved, capture me with grace, I will follow you, I will follow you, Please join me as we pray together this morning. Dear Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you this morning for your unsearchable greatness, your wondrous works, your glorious kingdom and power, your graciousness, compassion and mercy, your willingness to uphold us when we fall and to fulfill our desires and hear our cry. This morning we confess where we have fallen short of your ideal where we have not loved others as ourselves. We claim your promise that you will be faithful and just and forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness, just as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. We are thankful this morning that we can once again assemble together, for you have promised to be here with us, even where only two or three may be gathered in your name. In spite of the fires, the pandemic, the social injustice, the political unrest, and the economic uncertainty, we are thankful that you are our rock of strength, our refuge and defense, our glory and salvation, and that as we trust in you, we will not be moved. We are thankful for your guidance in taking care of the bodies you created for us. May we use our health and service to others who are in unhealthy situations. We pray that we as the body of Christ, the hands and feet, may make a positive difference in the world, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. In the midst of this crazy mixed up world, we pray for those who create solutions, as well as for those who merely blame others with whom they disagree. For those who are instruments of hope and peace, as well as for those who spread fear and cynicism, for those who bring light into the darkness of despair, as well as for those who demean and denounce. This morning, I pray for our church family, our children's ministries, our Pathfinders, and our Mesa Grande Academy. As Pastor Darren shares with and encourages us this morning, may he give us the optimism of Caleb and Joshua, who in spite of apparently insurmountable obstacles said, let us go up at once and occupy for we are well able to overcome. Now we commit ourselves to you this morning, 
that you may be able to say of us, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I will follow you. This world is nothing for me. Cause I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. I am saved, capture me with grace, I will follow you, I will follow you, I wasn't sure how to preach on Rahab. And there's a lot of questions in my mind. And yet, I think her story is so important for us. So, we're gonna dive right in. And here is where we're at in the story. Moses has just died. And he has appointed, who, Brielle? Josh, Josh, you know the story. Yes, it's Joshua. And Joshua has just told the Israelites, prepare your stuff because in three days we are going to cross over and take the city that God has promised for us. And as the people are preparing, he sends in two spies to check out Jericho and kind of see what the city is like, what their strengths or weaknesses are. They're just going to spy. But I, I always thought they would like, hide, like do the stealthy thing. Like, no, they walked in as if they were just strangers and they played it off. And I think pretty soon people caught wind that they weren't just strangers passing through because this was a land, this was a, a, a town where a lot of people passed through they caught on to what they were doing. Now, you have to know something about Jericho. The context here is so crucial, and I think Pastor Ken's gonna talk a little bit more about Jericho next week. Jericho was among several cities in Canaan. It was actually the most fortified of them all. It had two huge walls, 15 feet apart, and it was situated in this luscious oasis valley, which they called uh, the City of Palms. Uh, The Jordan River was just really good at watering everything around it, so of course, with the warm climate, you had delicious trees popping up everywhere, and people there were very prosperous, so which is why this was a prime spot to stop by on your way in and out, So it was literally the land flowing milk and honey. It was so rich. You have to know, though, that the Canaanites were very, very idolatrous people whose worship was sensuous and atrociously cruel. Their fertility rites and human sacrifices to Baal were shocking to everyone, but especially the Israelites. So Jericho wasn't exactly the kind of place where, you know, a God worshiper would want to go on a weekend spiritual retreat to. This was not the place you wanted to be found, especially if you feared God. In fact, the name Jericho may mean the city of the moon god. Like, this is just how dedicated it was to idol worship. Ellen G. White notes that Jericho was one of the principal seats of idol worship, being especially devoted to Ashtaroth, the goddess of the moon. And Rahab, perhaps, was in service of this goddess Ashtaroth. And 
in her city, she may have attained some sort of respect in the eyes of the Canaanites. The Adventist Bible commentary actually talks about these people. Check, check this out, it says, the people on the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean were as corrupt, as depraved as any who dwelt into this earth. I mean, she could have mentioned, I mean, the commentary could have mentioned any city, but it's mentioning Jericho, right? Like on all these places. They made a religion of lust. This was so horrific that 40 years prior, when the spies had gone in to scope out the area and they you know, had lost faith in God and the punishment was 40 more years in the desert, we talked about that a couple weeks ago, the instruction found in Deuteronomy 7.5 in the Message Bible says it pretty neatly. It says, you're going to go in there, you're going to tear apart their altars stone by stone, smash down their phallic pillars, chop down their sex and religion Asherah groves, and set fire to their carved God images. I mean, it was just so I, like, horrific. God's like, destroy it all. But it's so important to note that this was 40 years ago. And for 40 years, the Canaanites had ample time and ample opportunity for repentance. I mean, all of this evidence that happened and all of the travelers coming in through Jericho, giving them news, such as the Red Sea parting, right? And then the Egyptian army swallowed up. I mean, who's not gonna hear those news? And then they heard about the overthrow of the kings of Midian, of Gilead, of, of Basan. So these people knew. Yet no one, no one turned their hearts to God during this time. Except one person. So if you have a Bible in front of you, a Bible on your phone, I invite you to open to Joshua chapter 2. Following along in any version you like, I'm going to be reading out of the Message Bible. So this is our story for today. Joshua chapter 2. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out from Shittim two men as spies. Go, look over the land, check out Jericho. So they left and arrived at the house of a harlot named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, we've just learned that men arrived tonight to spy out the land. They're from the people of Israel. The king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you to stay the night in your house. They're spies. They've come to spy out the whole country. But the woman who had taken the two men and hid them, she said, Yes, the two men did come to me, but I didn't know where they'd come from. At dark, when the gate was about to be shut, the men left, and I have no idea where they went. Hurry up! Chase them! You can still catch them! But she had actually take them, taken them up on a roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that were spread out for her on the roof. So the men set chase down the Jordan Road towards the fords. As soon as they were gone, the gates were shut. Before the spies were down for the night, the woman came up to them on the roof and said, this is the most important part of the story, I know that God has given you the land. We're all afraid. Everyone in the country feels hopeless. We heard how God dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you left Egypt, and what he did to the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you put under a holy curse and destroyed. We heard it and our hearts sank. We all had the wind knocked out of us. And all because of you. You and God, your God, God of the heavens above and God of the earth below. That's a lot coming from somebody who probably worked for the goddess, right? Ashtaroth, extremely idolatrous person. Check this out, verse 12. She says, now promise me by God, 
I showed you mercy, now show my family mercy. And give me some tangible proof, a guarantee of life for my father and my mother, my brothers and sisters, everyone connected with my family. Save our souls from death. Our lives for years, said the men, but don't tell anybody our business. When God turns this land over to us, we'll do right by you in loyal mercy. She lowered them out the window with a rope because her house was on the city wall to the outside. She told them, run for the hills so your pursuers won't find you. Hide out for three days and give your pursuers time to return. Then get on your way. The men told her, in order to keep this oath you made us swear, here is what you must do. Hang this red rope out the window through which you let us down and gather your entire family with you in your house, father, mother, brothers, and sisters. Anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street is going to be killed. But that's going to be his own fault. We aren't responsible. But for everyone within the house, we take full responsibility. If anyone lays a hand on one of them, it's our fault. But if you tell anybody our business here, the oath you made us swear is canceled and we're no longer responsible. She said, if that's what you say, that's the way it is, and sent them off. They left and she hung the red rope out the window. So the spies headed out for the hills and stayed there for three days until the pursuers had returned. The pursuers had looked high and low but found nothing. The men, the spies, headed back. They came down out of the hills, crossed the river, and returned to Joshua, son of Nun, and reported all all their experiences. They told Joshua, Yes, God has given the whole country to us. Everybody there is in a state of panic because of us. The end. (laughs) Pastor Ken's going to finish that story. All right, so we are going to... Uh, mention something really cool because in Hebrews 11, there is a long list of people who are mentioned uh, about their faith. And we call that the gallery of faith. Like I call it the faith hall of fame. And in this gallery, we are going to talk about three people in this gallery. The first one is Rahab the prostitute. Today we're going to learn a few things you might not have known about Rahab. Number one, she was a prostitute and she was an innkeeper where the spies came to stay. Rahab, along with the rest of the Canaanite people, was aware of God, his power, and the powerful nation of Israel who were in fact coming after them and were going to be destroyed. Now that can raise quickly a question in our minds saying, Well, was this self-preservation, right? There's a lot of ethical dilemmas happening and and when the spies came, and surely she had two decisions. She could share responsibility of the death of two men whom she believed to be messengers of God, or she could tell a lie and save them. And and for most of us, we kind of tend to like stay right there. Let us talk about the ethics of her lie. Um, And and that's actually not where this conversation is headed, but... uh, I will say that when it comes to Rahab, we aren't looking at degrees of sinfulness here, but rather we're looking at the spiritual condition of one woman from Jericho. She chose to confess God and she put her faith in him. Her confession doesn't read as a cynical ploy to seduce spies with her supposed piety. But it seems much more accurate to describe her as a righteous Gentile to whom Israel's God also directs his mercy. So the fact that she acknowledged God's power kind of put in the stark contrast of like Israel's like constant inadequacy of their commitments. And I kind of think that's more important to highlight, right, than the ethics of of this decision that she made. So moving on. Number two, we're going to learn that Rahab belongs to a very unique of people. For example, she belongs to a group of people of non-Israelite ancestry who aid in the restoration of Israel's fortunes. People like Jael, right, Ruth, 
And in this particular story, she belongs to a group of people, of women, very few in the Bible, whose like, story is about them and their name is actually mentioned because sometimes the women of the Bible kind of tend to be left out, right? So in, in Joshua chapter 2, we see that besides Joshua, this is the only name that we see. We don't see the spies' names. We don't see the people commissioned by the king. We don't see anybody else. But Rahab's name is mentioned, and I think that is just the coolest thing ever. Also, Rahab belongs to a unique group of people who was least likely to succeed, but instead was vindicated by God. So the vindication of the underdog, and there's so many stories in the Bible, and I kind of want to encourage you to shout out, I mean, pretend we're like in Mount Rubido, like shout out stories of, of, of like the underdog winning. Come on. David and Goliath, good. Daniel, yes. Captive. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, thank you. Okay, so you remember like Joseph and his big brothers? right? The underdog, the vindication that came through Joseph. David, right? And his huge brothers, little scrawny dude taking care of sheep back there. Isaac versus Ishmael, Jacob versus Esau. And here come some of my favorites, Gideon, Tamar, Jethro, Jael, Uriah, Sarah, Rebecca, Hannah, and so many more. This unique group of people. Number three, Rahab is unique because she is part of God fulfilling his covenants. So any kids from MGA in fifth and sixth grade, we studied covenants. Anybody here from MGA, fifth and sixth grade? Okay, how many covenants did we say on Thursday that God made? Four, fantastic. One of them he made to Abraham. And Abraham, he promised to make them the father of nations and to bless all of the people that would come after him. So in order to fulfill this covenant with Abraham and his people, the Israelites, he used Rahab. I love it because God constantly reminds Israel that they weren't chosen because they were a mighty nation. When God chooses to restore and redeem Israel, it speaks to God's mercy and compassion rather than a righteous Israel. All right, friend, I'm going to pick on you one more time because I know how smart you are. His fourth covenant, remember the fourth covenant? Who did he make that with? The last one, it's called the new covenant. Jesus. Okay, I'll give you a hint. It's Jesus. All right. So Jesus, and who stands in the direct lineage of Jesus? Rahab, that's right. Rahab, when she, um, I'm not going to spoil the story for you, but afterwards she marries this guy named Salmon or Salmon. I don't know if you guys are hungry, whatever. She married Salmon and had a child. She named him Boaz, yes. You guys know the story, right? Okay. She named, and then, all right. And then he married Ruth and, and, and took care of Naomi. So I, I want to highlight that if anything, if we study the life of Boaz, um, there was a, a dating book called like Waiting for like, Mr. Right. I don't, know, I don't know what it was called, but it was about Boaz. And it was highlighting how like Boaz was like this dream dude who was like generous and compassionate and kind and like girls, like that's what you should focus on, finding your Boaz, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember. I don't think I read it. Um, <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Married Andre. That speaks to Rahab because Rahab raised him, right? So if we're actually looking at Rahab, like we know there's so much more to her than this identity that she was given. I mean, just look at Boaz. I mean, that's fantastic. So in this genealogy of Jesus, she is one of the three uh, women, she's one of the four women mentioned besides Mary. Three of them are adulteresses. Just, just, just let that sink, right? The others are Tamar, Ruth, and Bathsheba, who's not really mentioned, but it's Bathsheba. Once again, God is telling us that salvation is not dependent on human goodness, but on his free grace to sinners, and that he is willing to redeem especially the most sinful. Jesus said in 
Matthew 21, 31. Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom before you. That's how important it was for this message to come across. He was thinking about his great, 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 great grandmother Rahab. Number four, the last thing that we're going to learn about Rahab, this one's uh, particularly difficult for me to say out loud because Rob Wilson's here and I'm a little scared of that guy. He's weird. All right, so here it is. Rahab, despite her known identity and sins, reflected the image of God fully. Okay. (laughs) Why? Because when God looked at her, he didn't see harlot. Instead, he saw a woman of faith made in his image. Friends, there is no category of people made in the image of God and people not made in the image of God. There is one category and we're all the image of God, right? And because God is the author of our faith, he put Rahab's faithfulness, he put that in her, and he called out her faith that he had put in her, right? I was telling the first service people, like, we don't have a second pancreas that, like, produces faith. And God's like, where's your faith? But I have stopped producing it. No, like, that's not how it works. Like, God puts faith in you. Like, faith is this gift, right, that he gives you. And, and it was one of those things that Rahab was like, here's my faith, and it's in you. And God was like, I know it. I put it in your heart. And that's why I call you something else now. The new identity that she was given was not Rahab the harlot, but it was now Rahab the faithful. In fact, her portrait is hung next to Sarah's in the Faith Hall of Fame as one of the two, only two women mentioned in the Faith Hall of Fame. So I want you to take notice You, maybe as hard as this is to believe, are made in the image of God. When God looks at you, he sees something the rest of us don't see. He sees himself reflected in you. And he sees his faithfulness reflected in you. And and, and when... uh, Gideon, you guys know it's my favorite story of the Bible because I identify with him so much. You know that Gideon was the skinniest of the skinniest, the weakest of the weakest. He belonged to the least of the tribes, Manasseh, right? This guy wasn't even doing like brave manly stuff. He was doing the work of a woman. Like he was out hiding, doing the little wee thing in an old old wine press, right? Like this guy was was the nobody of the nobodies, And when God approached him, he said, hey, little nobody. No, he said, you, great warrior. I mean, that just blows my mind. Because God didn't like measure the size of his biceps when he came. Like he saw Gideon, but he saw something else. He saw something so much bigger. He saw Gideon made in the image of God, wearing this big robe of courage, maybe this armor of God. And he too is mentioned in the gallery of faith. So what do you think God calls you when he sees himself reflected in you? Revelation 3.12 has this beautiful verse and putting it in the context of Rahab, I rewrote it a little bit. It says this. She who overcomes, I will make her a pillar in the temple of my God, and she shall go out no more. I will write on her the name of my God and the name of, my, of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on her my new name. God gives us a name that is beyond our earthly identity. 
He puts a new name on you. And just like Rahab the prostitute became Rahab the faithful. So I told you we were going to talk about three people. The next person in the gallery of faith really surprised me. You don't want to know who it is? It's me. Very surprised. See, I was the most shocked to find out that when God called me, he saw something I couldn't see. All my life I'd been clinging to the names that had been given to me, or mostly I'd given myself. For example, I have a lot of names. A lot of them are not appropriate to share here. But uh, here's a couple. Viana the Proud. Viana the Arrogant. Viana the Inadequate. Viana Never Enough. Viana the Imposter. And the list is so big, friends. And he knew that in order for me to wear the name that he had given me, I would have to give up my past identities and not let them hold me back from what God called me into. So I asked that hard question. I said, how, how do I let go of everything I believe to be true about myself? And I remember going out to Lake Hemet and really, really wanting to discard these lies about me. The song, The Voice of Truth, was just ringing in my ears. Um, and so I picked up rocks for every name, for every identity that had been given to me or that I'd given myself, I picked up a rock. And some, of, some rocks were really, really big. And after a while, like my sweater was like full of rocks, my pockets were full of rocks, and, and, and um, I still had names. And, and, and so at the end of it all, I, I walk up to the edge of the lake, and I felt like God was kind of in the middle talking to me, and he said, now release the names. And some of them were, were not so hard to release, saying, okay, I, I don't want to be called Viana the skinny anymore. Like, that, that's horrible, right? Like, or Viana, the, and I was just throwing it out there. And then there were others that were so hard for me to let go of, like um, Viana never enough, right? And I held onto that rock, and I remember crying. I said, I, I, I can't, I don't know how to let go of this particular one. This one's really hard. And God was like walking me through it, and at some point, I just chucking all the rocks until I had no rocks left. And when I finished, I felt so good. I felt so free. But I felt like, well, wait a second. So I just got rid of all night. What is my name? And I felt like God was saying, you know the name I've given you. It's written in your heart. And I was a little hesitant because uh, these words had been given to somebody else in the Bible, but for some reason, like, I, I just knew it. Like, it, though it was my name. God said, yes, say it. What is it? And that day, I, I, I shyly asked God, I'm like, I think it's beloved in whom I am well pleased and I almost felt a little presumptuous saying that. And God said, yes, that is a name I've written in your heart. And I took that name and I put it on me and it felt so beautiful. God didn't see those names on me. But rather he saw his image in me, his faithfulness in me, and that new name, that identity that he saw. And believe me when I tell you this, friends, no one is more shocked than I am to find out that God can include someone like me in the hall of faith, the faith hall of fame. So now we come to the last one, and that's you. You who has been made in the image of God. You who has been given many names, 
many identities. I mean, think about it throughout the phases of our lives, right? We tend to take on mother or motherless or sick or some of your disease, like the diabetic or the old one or the young one or the kindergartner, like whatever it is. Like we, we tend to take on these names and identities and they're not very helpful at times because we kind of tend, tend to stick to them. Well, I can't do that because I am, you know, uh, whatever. Imagine if Rahab had done that. Imagine if Rahab had said, mm, I'm a prostitute and I, wear, you know, I serve the goddess Ashtaroth. What am I going to do in the face of this faithful nation? Like, how am I? Yeah, I'm just going to stay here in my lane, right? No. She took on this different identity, but it, so, it would have been so easy for her to keep that. So what is, what is it that you're, the names that you're struggling with? Now, God has given you a name already. But sometimes we're holding on to these names so tightly, and we haven't been able to take upon ourselves our new name. So what needs to change so that you can accept that new name he has put on you? So I, I challenge you to ask God, kind of like how I did, what is the name you've given me? What do you see when you see me? I'm curious. Which names do you want me to let go of so I can embrace and step into what you've called me? So, today, we give you a new title, a new identity, a new name. You, the faithful. You are faithful because the living God is in you and he is faithful. So friends, welcome to the Faith Hall of Fame. This world is nothing for me Cause I need you, Jesus To come to my rescue Where else can I go? There's no other name by which I am saved Captured Let's pray. God, as we go today, I'm just so grateful that you can see beyond our mess and go beyond what we are doing in order for you to see us made in your image. Thank you so much, God, for the names written in our hearts. And so I pray that the Holy Spirit be upon every person in this room. May today be a fresh start for many, discarding names and old identities and starting afresh for what you've called them into. A journey of faith, a journey of loving well, a journey of being beside you every step of the way. I pray this in your name, amen. Happy Sabbath.